morning, good afternoon, and welcome to Weird Sauce. And thank you for welcoming us into your location, I believe, in Malaysia. Yes, yes. I, I'm in um, Seminye, uh, which is uh, where my uh, university is based. Great. And could you introduce yourself for, for a listener? Sure. Um, my name is Neil Manny. Um, I'm British, technically British, um, but I was born in South America, born in a place called Guyana, which is kind of more Caribbean than it is South American. Um, so my mum's from Guyana, my dad is Scottish, and uh, I've been kind of living as an expat as a child with my parents in various countries, and then myself as an adult in various other countries, working as an academic. I work at the University of Nottingham. Um, they have a campus in Malaysia and one in China, and I'm based at the Malaysia campus uh, in the School of Psychology. And uh, yeah, my background is neuroscience. And uh, so now I do more, more cognitive neuroscience. Is there a particular part of cognitive neuroscience that you, you either prefer or you, are, you have specialized in? Uh, vision, um, visual cognition. Uh, I spent a lot of time doing research uh, on human eye movements and the use of gaze, which, which is head and eye movements, uh, around the scene. And I, and I kind of specialize in sort of real world activities. So I use real world portable eye trackers to look at people's use of gaze when they're, you know, doing sports or everyday activities. I've also worked with patients in the past. And since I've been in Malaysia, I work with orangutans for a, for a while. Vision is, is kind of the area I'm most interested in. Okay. And um, is it from the angle, because I think that vision is a, is a highly specialized field within uh, neuroscience. And a lot of the time neuroscience gets uh, exposed via much more sort of bridge uh, part, maybe such as, you know, prefrontal cortex, memory, stress, the kind of stuff that people are, can relate to much more uh, easily. How do you think vision um, relate to all the stuff that we care about in terms of the way that our brain works? Okay, well, I mean, the only way the brain can communicate with the, with the outside world is, is through the senses. So that's how it gets information in. Uh, and vision seems to be, you know, I, I would say the most dominant sense of, of those five senses. And then the only way the brain can, can then communicate with the exterior world is through action, through muscles. So I find it fascinating that you've got this, this input from the visual system. It's somehow then transformed and, and you know, uh, analyzed. And then a decision is made some, somewhere in the brain and we then execute some sort of motor plan. And that's what I find fascinating. I'm not sure if I answered your question correctly there, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, again, I think um, the way that, that this goes in terms of um, interest for how the brain works and how we perceive the world very much then, um, in my mind, enforces how we act in the world. So I am very interested in, for example, you, you mentioned primates, um, how similar or how differential are we from what you've been able to observe both in, in primates and in human in terms of how much our vision uh, influences our sense of action in the real world? Well, the work with the, the orangutans, um, the, you know, uh, they're also great apes, just as we are. And I don't find any difference between their, their eye movements and their use of gaze in, in the way that we do. Obviously, what they find interesting is different to, to put perhaps what we would find interesting. Um, but the way they allocate gaze and, and the way they, sh they would, for example, make a reaching and grasping movement towards that object is, is very similar. Um, you know, so, so I don't see any differences, really. Um, and that's perhaps why I think the work that neuroscientists do on primates uh, is so relevant you know, for humans, because we are so similar. Uh, uh, very true. I mean, that, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Robert Sapolsky at uh, Stanford, who 
who has studied. I absolutely adore him. I know this is a pitch, but um, I, I've I've just found his work and having lived myself in Africa for a long time, that the work that he did, you know, spending time between Kenya and and, uh, and uh, the U.S. and studying the the stress aspect of social stress in, in, in these primates and how that actually could relate to um, how we feel uh, in social stress in, for humans is, uh, has been absolutely fascinating. So I, I was aware of your work as well, and I wanted to understand whether there was a, a field that was quite unique to primate that we don't have in relation to um, vision, for example, or in, in relation to perception that might be very distinctly different than how we perceive the world. Um, that's, that's a really good question. I, I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, primates tend to live j just as we do in, in, in large social groups. And, and so what I find interesting uh, are the primates that don't live in large social groups. So, the, you know, the solitary creatures, for example, orangutans, uh, they don't live in large uh, social groups, uh, whereas chimpanzees, humans, gorillas, and, and bonobos do. Um, orangutans, if you read the textbooks, they say, well, they're semi-social. And, and you say, well, what does that mean? And it basically means that they live solitary lives apart from perhaps a couple of weeks during the year when there's a lot of fruit around, in which case they'll all head off to the fruit trees and they will naturally meet one or two others. But they're generally quite suspicious of the other orangutans, especially if they're males. So they're basically solitary, but can be social if they, if they want to be. Um, and then, of course, when we see them in zoos and, and wildlife parks, this is an artificial environment. So they don't normally hang around together. Um, so that's why I was very interested in, first of all, their kind of behavior when there's an individual animal interacting uh, with objects and I can record its eye movements. Um, but I'm also very interested in, in the way that they would uh, perceive others. And I find this interesting because my other interests, I mean, I mean I'm not doing any research in this area, but I am interested in things such as you know, robots and artificial intelligence. And so if you think about a robot that they're not really that social either, at least not yet, not yet. So uh, I think this, this, th this work, if you can look at primates and I include humans there, um, who are not particularly social, that will, perhaps yield some interesting questions as to what being social is about. That's a, that's a great way of looking at it. Now, in order to frame this, this how we started this conversation about vision and how vision leads uh, to some extent or inform our action and um, how a lot of our social connections are based on what we see, what we perceive and what we decide to do, I think it's, it would be a good time now to, to ask you how the the past uh, 15, 16 months have been for you, both as a human being going through what we've all been going through and also as, as a fundamental uh, role in society, which is um, teaching. Teaching is, is fun, one of these fundamental roles. And we've had uh, doctors on this podcast. We've had uh, people who've, uh, who've actually um, helped other people to get through it. And I think education has been one of these um, uh, domain that has been fundamentally affected. So it would be great to hear from you what has been that experience for you. Okay. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, it, it was all very confusing because we were all used to giving lectures, you know, in a big lecture theatre. Uh, there's a PowerPoint display behind you and you can waggle your laser pointer around. And for some of us, uh, and I include myself there, I like to interact with the students. So I will march out and say, hey, you, w w what do you think about this? A any questions, et cetera, et cetera. And you can't do any of that online. We didn't know how to do this online. 
We didn't know how they were going to do their examinations online because suddenly you can't have, you know, some guy walking up and down as, you know, invigilating quietly behind a couple of hundred students. You're worried about people cheating uh, online, access to the internet. Um, and so I think universities all over the world had the same problem. Uh, how do you do this? How, you know, how do you teach online? And, um, and so we all started slowly learning the software to do it, whether it be through, you know, through uh, Microsoft Teams or, or Zoom. And it, it, that, of course, depended on the number of people in your class, because places like Zoom or Teams, you know, they have a maximum number of people who, who, who can join. And then, of course, you've got to educate the lecturers because they, of course, don't know how to use this software. They don't have microphones. Uh, they don't have an internet connection very well at home. Uh, and you had people, you know, teaching from their balconies. You had people uh, s sneaking into campus just to, to use their office computer because that desktop was slightly better than the thing at home. Um, and slowly, I think, all over the world, people got the hang of it and how it went. But the examinations were a problem last year, in the, you know, last summer, and they were this summer. Um, sorry, last month. Uh, because again, you don't know how to ask questions to people if they got access to the internet. You don't know how long to give them time to set up. So each examination, for example, the timing had to be adjusted uh, to allow people for, you know, drop connections, to allow people to log in and so on. And lots of different software sprung up in the last year to help universities do this. How did you find it for yourself? I mean, you went from uh, con being contact fool and, uh, you know, I, I, I suppose like where, like wherever in, in the world, campuses are really hustling and bussing and, you know, professors are in demand. So how is that going from having loads of interaction every day to finding yourself in, in the restricted window of your computer? On the one hand, it was great because I'm, I'm not particularly extroverted. Well, on the other hand, it, 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 it was, as you rightly said, you know, it's, it's very re restrictive if you were just basically a prisoner um, in your living room, or in my case, it's, it's bedroom slash lab um, for, you know, what, 12, uh, 15 months. Uh, yeah, it can get very annoying. And prior, prior to this, uh, so you, you're living in Malaysia, for the, for the listeners who are not aware, it's a country that has lots and lots of beautiful scenery, beautiful things uh, that can be done outdoor. Um, and it's a climate that's quite good for doing those things almost year round. So, and it's similar to Singapore, uh, if, I'm not, uh, if I'm not wrong in the sense that it's quite hot and it's humid. So... Did you find it very uh, oppressive or sort of, you know, comforting to be away from nature? Because we had, we've had different response to people where people were stuck in cities or whether they were, you know, they were in the wilderness. Their, their experience of lockdown and this pandemic has been very, very different depending on your location. So how is it for you? Before we even knew there was going to be a pandemic, I decided after living in a sort of a, uh, a popular area of Kuala Lumpur with lots of shops and bars and restaurants right next door to me. Um, I decided I was going to move into a more sort of a country area. And I'd already put a deposit on an apartment uh, to rent, which is very close to my campus. My campus, by the way, is a, it's an hour's drive out of Kuala Lumpur. It's in a very scenic location. Um, anyway, uh, the pandemic came along, so I couldn't move. And so during those two months, sort of the July, August, after the first wave, I moved out here to, I, I think, a very nice area. There's lots of trees around me. It's very quiet. Um, I love it. But then, as, as you were saying, the second wave came and I realized, well, gosh, I, I don't actually have access to any of the shops that... <laughs> that I was so used to right in the center of KL. 
So my, my sort of uh, creature comforts are now an hour's drive away, which I had planned to do every weekend, but now I can't do that for several months. So everything has to be delivered and sort of my, my European comforts that I'd gotten used to, you know, things like olives, wine and so on, uh, I, I just don't have. Um, so it, it's been kind of good for me. I've, I've lost weight <laughs> and I've been walking a lot more out in the countryside. So I think that's done my, my mental health some good. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm very isolated. Mm. So pr prior to that, do, would you say that, you know, you, you actually thought about this? Because I think that's a discussion we've had with a lot of people that said that this pandemic has, has put them back into thinking what their life, their daily life was like, uh, because it put everything in perspective in a 12 hour period that you're not asleep. What is it that you're going to do? Uh, between what you need to do and what you can do to make yourself feel better and that those options might be very very limited compared to before so would you say that this this has kind of changed your perspective on your own lifestyle behavior whether it be sleep uh, physical activity you've mentioned a little bit about this did you have you changed your the way that you 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 know you you conceive of food how to get food some people have thought about raising food themselves I mean has there been a fundamental, at least perceptual changes in how you consider your daily life? And if so, w in what way? You're right. Um, I think uh, my, my life has changed uh, in the last year, and I think it's for the better. I mentioned that I've, I'm, I'm walking a lot more with the dog. I'm losing weight. Uh, I'm doing a little bit more cooking for myself than I used to, going back to... Um, 20, 30 years ago when I used to do a lot of cooking and then I became very uh, lazy in this, you know, when I was living in, in KL and just eating in restaurants every night and working harder. Now I'm working less, um, but we're generally, yeah, enjoying life more. <laughs> And in terms of mental health, so we, we go back to this vision thing, which I'm kind of curious, um, both on a scientific level and on, on the human level. So I know personally when I go out, outside, whether it is in Scotland, and I love Scotland so much, um, or it's taking a walk here in a non-built sort of built area of Singapore, my mind instantaneously changes in terms of the scale so if I look at, and, and it has a lot to do intuitively with the way that the vision is, is organized. So I look, I look in, in front of me, instead of having something that is boxed, I have something that is open. And I intuitively almost feel immediately better if nothing is in front of me that boxes it. So I'm wondering to what extent do you think this also has, has got a silent impact on mental health, the fact that our scale of everything has now been diminished to a room, a screen, everything that's kind of in terms of scale seems to be ever so reductive. And we don't have, for a lot of us, access to wide open spaces because of the condition under which we are. So how do you think in your, in your scientist mind and, and in your personal experience, do you think that might impact our mental health? Well, that's a good question. Um... I don't really know the answer to, you know, some, someone say, say a farmer who's always out uh, in big open spaces, they're not really going to notice any difference because of the pandemic. I was having a, a discussion with one of my students. One of her, res uh, her research projects for her final year, she wanted to look at the influence of room color on people's mental health during the pandemic. And, you know, being a, a grumpy professor, I was saying, well, listen, you know, you need a control group. And, and really the ideal control group would be people in prison. Or it would be people perhaps stuck in a hotel room because in a hotel room or in prison, you don't really have the choice over the color of the room. Whereas and uh, at home, you perhaps do have the choice over what color to paint the room and what posters to put on the wall. 
But if you're in student accommodation or in prison, and uh, sometimes I don't see any difference between the two, you, you don't really have a choice on the color of the room. So if color of your surroundings has an effect upon your mood and, you, and you're suddenly forced to spend a lot of time in that room, then uh, surely space also has that effect. Um, but to answer your question, I don't know how space would affect that. I'm pretty sure it does, but I, I don't know how. I mean, as a scientist, you could say, well, maybe if you just walked 10,000 steps every day, even if you're in a tiny space, say a, a prison cell, then that's better than not walking 10,000 paces, even though you're in the same space. So, so therefore the question isn't about the, the, the space around you, but it's about how often you've traveled. Does that make sense? Yeah, does it, yeah, I guess, I guess, am I understanding correctly that you, you associate the movement with the, the benefit yes. to some extent? So the movement in and of itself, we know metabolically will have definitely a very good effect, both physiologically into your body and cognitively for the mind. Yeah. Um, but I'm just wondering this concept of, um, of, of scale. The visual input. Um, yes, the, the, this idea that the variety of what we are exposed to right now. Um, and, and also the, this perception that we may not be able, or we are not able in some of the cases because of lockdown, to have been able to come out of a given location. So therefore that we have pre-programmed the brain to be reduced in its availability heuristics, so to speak, right? So yeah. it, it would be almost like if we had the chance to say virtual reality, a room, and then the actual reality, and how would that actually impact glucocorticoid, stress hormone, and also self-reported perception of depression, mood, etc. I think there's something there that I intuitively have felt, and I'm very curious whether there's a scientific on, on the vision level of the brain, there's a scientific underpinning for that. Yeah. Again, I, uh, I don't know the answer. That, that those, are, those are really good questions. Um, for, from the point of view of the retina, uh, are you saying that the more space or, or depth that is processed on the retina throughout the day, as compared to say looking at a flat two D screen. Yeah, like variety. If you if you think if we think in in very simple um, simple terms of what our vision field does for us on an everyday basis, when we have the ability to have different experiences. So you have your room, you have wherever you work. And then, so that has a certain amount of color variety, of depth, of scale. And then if you're lucky enough to live in a place like Singapore, Malaysia, or Scotland, and you have some ability to go into nature, you then go into something that has totally different vibrancy of color, that may have depth, that are very different, and it's an open space. So that's gonna give you an experience very different, uh, both cognitively and I think, intuitively from the stress response that that's doing something because physically people report feeling better when they're outside and they're walking outside versus you're on a treadmill and you're walking you feel better yeah. but relatively speaking you feel even better when you walk outside in the open space so i'm wondering with this huge lockdown scale that we have all lived through at, at the world level because i mean there are some countries that have been spared but very far and few so I'm wondering in terms of mental health, because that's something that's popping up in, in the press and the literature now. How do you think that this might contribute um, to problems that are, would be lingering? Or do you think this is more transient and people, the moment that people can, can move around, this will be, this will be forgotten? Okay, the, the, there's two questions there. I think it's kind of transient if it comes to simply being indoors versus outdoors. But I, I also think there will be permanent problems with mental health when it comes to individuals uh, who say, for example, haven't 
they, they've lost a year's worth of education, for example. And, and that's going to have a knock-on effect for a long time. Not just for their job prospects, for example, um, but for many other things. You know, um, spending an additional year with your parents, for example, if you're a teenager, is going to perhaps strengthen that relationship, but it's also, it, it could well damage it. Um, so there, there are many facets to this pandemic which w we won't really find out uh, for, for a few years yet. Uh, to come back to your first point about um, having access to, to the outdoors, I think, so, so, so I have a friend in the UK, he, he goes jogging a lot. Um, and he said that's the only way he, he handled the pandemic. And of course, internally, I was thinking, well, over here, they're locking up joggers. <laughs> right? um, because they're all, you know, they're all misinterpreting the rules. Um, so I do think access to the outdoors is important, but but what is it, you know, what, I, what actually is the outdoors is a very hard thing. You were spot on when you talked about the difference between artificial intelligence, sorry, uh, um, virtual reality and uh, reality. Uh, I don't know what that difference is when it comes to being indoors or outdoors, but I think, you know, you've hit the nail on the head. If you could give people virtual reality outdoors while they're stuck in a pandemic, then I think that would be a very good thing. In the same way that computer games, I think, can be beneficial to a degree. But it's, again, it depends on what the computer game is. So in, in the... Um the cohorts of students that you have, are they primarily uh, local students or do you have also international students? And if so, how do you think that their experience has been, do you have any feedback from them that they, they're really struggling? Because we're hearing a lot of this from other universities. Yeah. And yeah. foreign students, uh, for example, in, in the US, and, and I have some experience with the UK, um, were and continue to be very affected by this for uh, for a lot of reasons. So in Malaysia and in your university particularly, um, how, has, how has been that experience? Yes, um, it's a British university, but, but we have a campus in Malaysia, which means that uh, because we're teaching the same degrees that they teach in the UK campus, we have a, a lot of students coming here for a number of reasons. Um, who want a British education, uh, but they can go to the UK for a number of reasons. It might be financial reasons. Um, I, it might be for religious reasons. Malaysia is a Muslim country, and so a lot of the food is halal and so on. Uh, and so we do have an awful lot of international students. I would say 40% of the campus uh, is uh, non-Malaysian. Um, and so, yeah, I've been giving tutorials at 11 o'clock at night, trying to suit different time zones. Um, I know other lecturers are, uh, are doing the same thing. And we've had students, problems with visas, of course, uh, losing their visa uh, rights, being stuck in this country and therefore, or that country and uh, unable to renew visas and then the visas run out through time periods. It's the same for lectures. I, I also have the same problem with, with my employment visa. Um, so I couldn't go anywhere for months because although my employer had renewed my visa, there was nobody at the government office to process it because they were all locked down and, and stuck at home. So, and, and it's the same for all the students as well. So people are stuck everywhere. Um, all trying to attend lectures online or, or trying to do examinations online. And then, you know, there, there are special catch-up lectures programmed, as well as uh, additional examinations programmed for people who, just, who didn't get in the first time for, for a number of reasons. And have you found that, because um, this, this is a question that I, 
I'm wondering a lot listening to some of these students, especially uh, not necessarily people in first or second year, but uh, some some postdocs, some PhDs that we interact with um, uh, in 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 work. And the feedback that I've had is some of them really are re-questioning the whole concept of their education. Because when you look at something like a PhD or a master's degree, but PhD particularly, it's so long, it is so demanding, and it's so expensive. And they're looking at the world right now, and there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. Um, and some, some industry, the uncertainty is just huge. And I'm wondering whether in your uh, area, You've 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 already witnessed um, within some of your students these questioning happening whether they're they have less trust in education and whether that education is a worthy investment of time and effort and money, or whether it is much more that if they don't know whether they want to do that and they may actually want to do something completely different. So what what has been your experience there with your own students? Um, you're obviously far more approachable than I am, Flo. Um, I, 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 I'm the scary professor, so I'm the last guy they normally come to to talk about these kind of things. Um, but yeah, I have noticed a couple of students, good students, you know, uh, A grade students who said, yeah, I'm going to take a year out. The universities said, you know, we either do everything online or we just take a year out. So I'm going to take a year out and, and, and reconsider things. But they haven't really gone beyond that and said, uh, you know, I want to re reconsider my entire life. But I, I do suspect that's happening. And, and I've also heard uh, from colleagues who are more approachable that this is what some of the students are saying. But I, 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 I personally haven't heard that. Right, right, right. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, again, it, it might be a function also of what field you're in and, and whether people are... Uh, willing or even the culture sometimes the culture is you know yeah. is a big issue for some people they're very shy to share personal things but it seems to me that at every level um, and we have friends that have younger kids at every level it seems to have disturbed something and in fact we were talking with Dr. Lustig in the U.S. who during his episode even said that his own daughter who used to have I think if I remember correctly his terms was a love for learning um, really kind of the, the, the lockdown and the Zoom experience and everything really took that away, at least for, for now. And, and I think for a lot of young people, and not just young people, it has put into perspective what's valuable and what's not, maybe. And, I, and you, as, as, a, as a professor, has it, has it changed how you perceive you're going to run your future? Or if we're to experience even occasional pandemic that would lead to months and months and months of this repetition of life that we've just had. How is that informed or not at all how you perceive your future in being a professor, being where you are in a location that you are? Have you, in other words, have you done a rethink about your life, which I think a lot of people have? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I was saying earlier, um, I love uh, recording individuals' eye movements while they're doing everyday activities, including sport, horse, horse riding, etc. And in a pandemic where you're not allowed to to get within a meter of someone, you can't really set up this equipment uh, and and do any experiments, you know. And of course, the university uh, prohibits it um, unless it's in you know very specific cases where you've got PPE equipment and. Uh, everything sterilized, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and only for PhD students who are about to, you know, not get their PhD because they couldn't do their studies. Apart from that, you know, it, it's not allowed. So I haven't done any research since the pandemic started. I, I've been uh, supervising undergraduates through, through their online experiments in psychology. And so it's, it, you're right, it, you know, I've definitely questioned whether or not I'll be doing any research after this finishes. Um, I am, I mean, I'm, I'm running a couple of online studies at the moment that I'm, I'm quite keen to pursue. This is in collaboration with other researchers. So it's really the, their studies that, that I'm working on, one of which is on uh, 
ASMR and I don't, I don't know if you've heard of ASMR, but it's a huge YouTube phenomenon. No, I have not. It's a huge YouTube uh, phenomenon where people get this uh, response. Um, you, you need to check it out. Just, just type ASMR uh, into YouTube. Uh, and you'll find out. And, and now people have published some works showing that it's, um, it, it, these videos create a biological response. Oh, I think, I'm, I think I've, I've read something about this. Uh, some, somebody clicking, am I right in thinking? Yeah. I read something about somebody clicking fingers and then they somehow they use that repetition video for whatever therapeutic reasons, or it does something to them physiologically. I vaguely remember something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, yes. So it, it's people doing mundane tasks such as eating slowly in front of the camera or folding towels is, is apparently a very famous one. Um, and things like this, um, or running their fingernails across, you know, uh, cotton surfaces and so on. That apparently creates this ASMR response, which is kind of like a tingling sensation at the back of the head, flows down. And so I'm working with a researcher in the UK. She's published uh, data showing that, you know, you get physiological changes uh, to the body in, in these individuals who report having it. It's only about 20% of people um, who experience this. So the study I'm, I'm working at the moment uh, on is where we're looking at, first of all, we need to get enough people who, who report a positive response to these videos that we've been creating. And then we're going to run them through a trust game. I don't know if you've heard of the trust game, but um, perhaps I'm giving away too much, but so anybody listening can't do this study now. But <laughs> Uh, it's to do with oxytocin levels. So the head researchers are interested in uh, levels of oxytocin. We can record oxytocin online, um, but that would be a step in the future. So we're looking at, you know, uh, apart from this physiological response, is it linked to anything else? For example, more trusting or, or less trusting behavior. So th that's one kind of study I, I, I've agreed to be part of because I found it interesting and it does involve a visual representation. You know, you have to watch videos as well as an auditory component. Um, so I can see my research going more online uh, in the future. I'm not sure I want it to be more online. I do enjoy recording badminton players and, and horse riders and, and their eye movements. And, and, and surgeons, look, you know, all, all that kind of stuff I, I found really interesting and I want to get back to that. But yeah, I mean, surgeons and badminton players also have to watch videos. They also have to do, you know, virtual reality training. Uh, that sounds like an excellent, like, book yeah. name, a book title. Surgeon and badminton player also have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So do you think going forward, what has been, you talked a little bit about your comfort creature thing at the beginning, uh -huh. because we all had to have some sort of comfort. And again, depending on whom we spoke with, uh, comfort has been either maladaptive or very adaptive. So both in terms of activity, daily behavior, food, what kind of sensory thing have you used to help you get through that? Okay. So before I moved out here to the countryside, um, and I was still living in KL, I, I was suffering from insomnia. Uh, and I found I had a, a great problem going to sleep. So what I started doing was I started listening to um, natural sounds to put me to sleep. And now, now this is something I, I used to, I wouldn't say laugh at, but I didn't take very seriously years ago, you know, when people would talk about listening to whales or dolphins. Um, 
but then I started doing it. I, st- I started listening to the waves. I find the, the waves, and, and you, can, you can get these, these recordings on Spotify and places like this, or YouTube. The waves, you know, the rivers, thunderstorms I really like, the sound of rain. And th- this used to help me fall asleep. So now I no longer have a problem falling asleep. I do have a problem staying asleep, but I, I don't have a problem falling asleep anymore. And, and it's, I think it's because of this, and I, I, you know, I have to listen to at least a couple of hours every night uh, of these waves or thunderstorms or just leaves or, or rain dripping, something like this. They got me interested in audition. They got me interested in uh, Fourier analysis, uh, noise components, uh, and then when my, my colleague came along and said, are you interested in, in ASMR? That, um, I said, well, I've never heard of it, but that sounds exactly the sort of thing I'd like to pursue. So to answer your question, I definitely would suggest to people who are having problems uh, indoors with the pandemic to listen to, if they can, if they have access to the internet and, and Spotify and, and, and others, you know, sources, to listen to natural sounds, including the whales communicating, including elephants communicating, even uh, cats purring. I listened to a, a cat purring the other night for two hours. It, I mean, you know, it, it drove my girlfriend crazy, but it made me uh, really relaxed. And so I would suggest, you know, don't take it too seriously, but certainly go through these things. You will find something that that's, that's really relaxing, um, definitely. And are you looking, like all of us, I think it's it's fair to say I've, I've said when this is over, which is, seems like a, a sentence that will never come to fruition. When, yeah. But when this is over, we will do X. So what is, do you have an X and, and, and do you think that when this is over, there's something that you've put on hold or that you've always wanted to do or that has been revealed to you while on lockdown that you would definitely do the moment that door gets open? Yeah, um, I'm kind of doing everything I kind of like already, you know, to do. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is, is, is go to the beach. Um, I, I miss the beach a lot. As soon as international travel is over, I'll be going to some beaches. Um, not, not to say that Malaysia doesn't have great beaches, it, it does. Uh, but yeah, I'll be going to lots of beaches. Uh, but maybe you're asking something beyond what I would do immediately, right? Well, uh, an immediate thing, I think there, there's two, there's two part, I guess, to that question is, you're right, there is an instinctive part. A lot of us have been like saying, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for X. And that's, I would say, the immediate reward, the immediate sign that this is over, that we're not stuck anymore. But perhaps also a longer thing, because I think in this question that we've had for months in our head is, have I done all I wanted to do? Is there something that I've always wanted to do that I, I pushed away? And now is the time, because I don't know that I will have that time again if we go back into other lockdown or if I don't have the time. So is there been a much longer plan that you had and that this is put into perspective and that you are definitely going to put into action or that you've actually put into a drawer and you realize actually it wasn't that meaningful? Perhaps the latter. Um, I'd always had a plan to learn a musical instrument properly as opposed to the forced sessions that my parents put me through as a kid. Um, and I, you know, always said, I'll do that when I'm, you know, comfortable and relaxed and ready. But now I find that I, I've never actually got time to do that. I mean, that's in my head. Obviously, I, I do have time. I'm stuck at home all day and I shouldn't be working. Um, but I find myself doing that. I find myself putting off gardening. When I moved out here, I actually had a garden for the first time in many years. And I thought, well, you know, this is great. I can do some gardening and be out in the outdoors. But I haven't done any gardening, um, even though it, it's literally just, you know, one floor away from me. So I'm, I, I suspect 
playing an instrument is, is going to follow the same track that I just uh, won't get around to it. Um, and, and there are other things uh, on my list for this summer, now that teaching uh, stopped last week, uh, is, to, is to learn another computer program. Uh, that's kind of really nerdy. Uh, it doesn't take me away from the screen, which is what I should be doing. Expedition plan. You're not going to climb Everest. No. You're not no. going to swim the Antarctic. No, no plans, really. No. Well, you know, sometimes no plan is a plan because um, I think what this has probably taught us as well is we probably had a lot of redundancy in our plans uh, since we've been able to do without them for 15 months and for some of us without that much of, a, of an impact. Now, to conclude this conversation, um, I would like you to share with our listener uh, the same question that I ask all my guests. So you, you, you've you had a very interesting childhood and life. You've traveled the world. You come from a very interesting background. You, you're doing something very interesting in terms of science. Um, and you live in a, in, a, in, a, in a different country than perhaps a country of origin. Um, so that, that makes you a, quite a, an outlier to some extent um, in terms of human being. So what do you have, first of all, do you have a, a weird sauce for life? And, um, and if, if that's not too much to ask, what is that so that our listener can be inspired by that? I think, I think people just need to travel more. Um, and that would be my, my weird sauce. Um, I don't mean two days in an Airbnb somewhere. I mean minimum of a month somewhere, you know. And I think if people were to just travel more often, we would see much less nationalism, much less xenophobia. Um, preferably, you'd want to actually go to that place. But if you can't, you know, you can still go there on, on the internet and see these places. Uh, so my, my weird source would, would be to just keep experiencing uh, different places. Don't become a citizen of, say, one country. You know, become a citizen of the world. I mean, that's how I see myself. Neil Mann, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I wish you well in both your gardening and your music endeavor, even if it's not now, it's in the future. Thanks, Phil, yeah. Don't forget about them. And of course, I wish you to have access to beaches as soon as we possibly can do that. Thanks, Phil. Thank you again and uh, all the best for the coming months. Thank you. If this conversation stopped you in your track, share it with your network. You never know whose life you might change for the better. Thank you for listening. Stay curious about our next guest and stay curious about life.